Uh, thank you, and it's great to be here. I would say, Steve, we're still friends. A uh, little criticism uh, won't, won't do anything about that. The only thing that might have uh, broken our friendship is if you had uh, suggested that the current vice chairman be the deputy governor in charge of financial <laughs> stability. <laughs> I think Paul made the same suggestion, didn't you, uh, in front of Congress sometime? Paul started by saying why he was here. I think I'm here because, like many people in this room, I just can't say no to Dewey. So uh, I've been here for 10, 15 years uh, every January uh, teaching, teaching Dewey's class. So January in Nashville has been uh, not, not the attraction. It's been uh, getting to know Dewey, getting to know those great classes that he's been he's been teaching. So I do want to talk a bit about what we've been doing and why uh, in response to the financial turmoil and economic weakness of the past 18 months, the Federal Reserve has been taking unprecedented steps in conducting monetary policy. Not only have we reduced our target federal funds rate aggressively, essentially to zero, but we have also made credit available to institutions and markets in which we had not previously intervened. To varying degrees, similar actions have been taken by other central banks around the world. Now for Dewey's class each January, I've been describing my take on the framework for making monetary policy, and I thought a natural extension of that role in a way for honoring Dewey and his abiding interest in policy making would be to talk about how the crisis has and has not affected that framework. Chairman Bernanke has done that already in several speeches, but I thought participants in this conference might find my perspective useful, and I'll be answering some questions about uh, what we're doing and why in the process of this uh, discussion. Although our actions have been unprecedented, the framework in which I've been considering them remains at its most fundamental level the same as the one I've been describing to Dewey's classes over the years. Our objective is to promote maximum sustainable employment and stable prices over time. These goals are enshrined in law. They make sense in economic policy and theory. Central banks are uniquely suited to promoting price stability they contribute to maximum employment and growth over time by eliminating the uncertainties and distortions of high and unstable inflation. The goal of maximum employment also is critical. A balance between aggregate demand and potential supply is needed to maintain price stability. In addition, significant fluctuations in output impose costs on the economy, add to uncertainty, impede planning and growth. Our monetary policy actions in the crisis have been aimed at fostering these two goals of price stability and maximum employment. We achieve our objectives by influencing financial conditions, the cost and availability of credit, and asset prices. Changes in financial conditions in turn affect spending and thus the balance between aggregate demand and potential supply. And how close we are to maximum employment is a basic ongoing, ongoing determinant of inflation. Slack reduces inflation. Overly high resource utilization increases it. The other determination is inflation expectations. If inflation expectations are not anchored, if they respond to our actions or to persistent gaps between actual and potential output, inflation itself will follow. Historically, we've achieved needed adjustments in financial conditions by moving our federal funds rate target. We've done that by su adjusting supply of bank reserves through open market operations in the Treasury market and in the government securities market. In well-functioning financial markets, changes in actual and expected targets for the federal funds rate are arbitraged through the system to affect the cost of credit and price of assets. Many factors affect these markets. Relationship of our actions to financial conditions vary widely. But on balance, we've been able to use our control of the federal funds rate to make adjustments in financial conditions needed to foster our objectives for prices and employment. So this is basically the story, Dewey, I think I, I tell every January in your class. From, from the very time that financial market turmoil emerged in force in August of 2007. However, 
We could see that the relationship of the federal funds rate to financial conditions and hence to spending was especially disrupted. And any given federal funds rate was implying much tighter financial conditions than usual. Banks became quite uncertain about the losses they might have to absorb on mortgages and other lending, about the losses their counterparties might have to suffer, about the extent to which their liquidity was at risk from having to support off-balance sheet entities or from experiencing a withdrawal of their own lenders. This uncertainty made banks much more cautious about extending credit to each other and to households and businesses. As financial disruption continued and the economy weakened, lenders generally became much more uncertain about the financial condition of borrowers, sparking a strong preference for safe and liquid assets like Treasury bills. Trading liquidity in many markets dried up. The usual arbitrage among markets broke down, spreads widened, often by more than seemed justified by the underlying deterioration in the economy and the ability of borrowers to repay. Tightening of financial conditions in turn further restrained demand and economic activity, and this adverse feedback loop between financial conditions and the economy has been a very prominent feature of the current recession. Now, the Federal Reserve took a two-pronged approach to countering the effects of financial stringency on the economy. We used our conventional policy tools and we initiated a range of unconventional policy actions to support the extension of credit. In the first category, we cut the federal funds rate target, and we did so aggressively after the economy began to weaken in late 2007. By December of last year, we'd reduced the target to zero to a quarter percent. Lowering the funds rate helped to offset a portion of the effects of financial disruption on credit conditions for households and businesses, and easing policy should have helped the flow of credit by reducing some of the concerns about the effects of a weaker economy on repayment prospects. But reducing the federal funds rate has not been sufficient, and so we have taken other actions to ease conditions in credit markets more directly, what Chairman Bernanke called credit easing. In many respects, these actions have been extensions of our traditional methods of operation, though they have taken us into new territory and which we have used our tools in new ways. Beginning early in the turmoil, we eased the terms on which we lent to depository institutions, our traditional borrowers, and we did that quite dramatically. We lowered the interest rate on discount window loans, increased the maturity, to re and to reduce the stigma of borrowing from the discount window, we created an auction facility for discount credit. We cooperated with foreign central banks and currency swaps to make dollar funding available to banks operating abroad. Later, for the first time since the 1930s, we extended credit to non-depository institutions, granting discount window access to primary dealers when it became evident that constraints on their access to liquidity threatened broader financial stability and economic activity. Given the increasing reliance on securities markets to intermediate credit in our financial system, as Paul was discussing, these dealers had become more central to maintaining the flow of credit from savers to borrowers. Last fall, when a run on money market funds was severely constricting their purchases of commercial paper, important source of credit to many businesses, we supported the funds, their customers, their borrowers by making credit available that allowed the money funds to meet heavy redemption requests and also provided credit directly to borrowers in the commercial paper market. Our objectives in these programs are consistent with central banks' classic function as lenders of last resort. We are encouraging the continued provision of private sector funding to intermediaries by assuring the creditors of those intermediaries that sound banks and other intermediaries have a sure source of liquidity to repay debts. When, despite this encouragement, private lenders have such a strong preference for safety and liquidity that credit is not forthcoming, we lend, 
often at a penalty rate relative to normally functioning markets. And that lending is intended to prevent disorderly, disruptive failure, failures, fire sales of illiquid assets, which would drive asset prices lower, intensify the disruption of credit flows, deepen the pullback in spending. Most recently, in collaboration with the Treasury, we have begun supplying liquidity to purchasers of securitized credit. Under this program, private investors absorb credit risk up to a certain level. Treasury takes the bulk of the rest of the credit risk. The Federal Reserve's residual risk is designed to be quite small. The asset-backed securities market that this program supports had become a key vehicle over the past couple of decades for financing credit extended to households and businesses, but its functioning deteriorated rapidly over the second half of last year, with the issuance tailing off almost completely, just about to zero in the fourth quarter. The availability of credit from the Federal Reserve, the insurance against severe downside risks from the Treasury, should buoy demand for securitized debt and bolster the flow of credit to households and businesses. <coughs> A shortage of funding has not been the only factor impeding the extension of credit. Lenders have been concerned about counterparty risk, about conserving their own capital against unforeseeable events. We can't deal with those concerns through our lending because we do not take appreciable credit risk. But confidence about access to funding has been part of the problem. It's reflected in the evaporation of trading and term maturities in a wide range of funding markets and the elevated spreads paid by even very safe borrowers. The limited availability of credit to sound borrowers, even when secured by what had been good collateral, has been a source of instability and constraint on credit flows. Central banks can address such a shortage because they can remain unaffected by panicky flights to liquidity and safety, and the willingness of central banks to extend collateralized lending in size against a broad range of assets can replace flows of private credit that are normally uncollateralized. Another aspect of our efforts to affect financial conditions has been the extension of our open market operations to large-scale purchases of MBS agency debt and longer-term treasury debt. We initially announced our intention to undertake large-scale purchases last November when the federal funds rate began to approach zero and we needed to begin applying stimulus through other channels as the economic contraction deepened. These purchases are intended to reduce intermediate and long-term interest rates on mortgages and other credit to households and businesses. Those rates are important. They influence decisions about investments and long-lived assets like houses, consumer durable goods, business capital. In ordinary circumstances, the typically modest volume of central bank purchases and sales of those long-term assets has only small and temporary effects on their yields. However, the extremely large volumes have been easy, right? We've recognized we're venturing into new ground and that our uh, actions will have consequences, not all of them perfect. But in every case, I think it's been a question of what's the alternative and what's best for the economy and financial markets. Have they been effective? Yes, I believe our actions have helped ease financial conditions, though obviously they can't address all the problems in financial markets. The situation in financial markets and the economy would have been far worse if the Federal Reserve hadn't taken the actions we did in supplying liquidity and lowering our federal funds rate. Clearly, sharp decreases in the federal funds rate target have shown up directly in other short-term interest rates. Our commercial paper facilities help stabilize money market mutual funds and have steadied the commercial paper market and lowered rates for high-quality borrowers. The announcements of our purchases of mortgage-backed securities and Treasury bonds have reduced mortgage rates and other long-term interest rates appreciably by some estimates as much as 100 basis points. Our provision of liquidity to banks in the United States and via currency swaps to banks abroad appears to have eased pressures in dollar funding markets as indicated by declines in spreads between LIBOR and OIS. 
This easing has lowered, in, lowered rates for bank borrowers, paying, paying uh, rates tied to LIBOR, and given banks better access to interbank liquidity to support lending and market making. The extension of liquidity to primary dealers has been critical in providing stability when private lenders have, from time to time, become reluctant to make even secured loans to these counterparties. In our own, our own sense, reinforced by reports from many market participants, is that our willingness to extend credit to commercial and investment banks prevented a far worse market outcome when flights to safety and liquidity intensify, say, around the time of Bear Stearns or in the second half of September. Private lenders have demanded that intermediaries be much less leveraged. That development is healthy over the long run, but when the transition is compressed by extreme risk aversion and market participants are forced to delever through fire sales, the financial markets and the economy suffer. I see our liquidity facilities as allowing for a more gradual and controlled process. Are we allocating credit? The ac our actions are aimed at increasing credit flows for the entire economy. We are not trying to favor some sectors over others. However, an element of credit allocation is inherent in some of our interventions. That element grows out of the very market characteristics that have necessitated those interventions and have made such interventions effective. If markets were highly liquid, Investors and lenders were willing to take normal risks and arbitrage across markets. Financial conditions wouldn't have tightened so much, intensifying the downturn and adjustments in the federal funds rate alone could well have been suffi sufficient to stabilize the economy. As we have been forced to attack overly tight financial conditions by extending our discount window facilities to new intermediaries in certain markets, and to extend open market operations to HSC debt and MBS, we have recognized that the resulting effects can be uneven across markets and lenders. This is not a comfortable outcome for a central bank, and we have taken steps to minimize the extent of any such credit allocation. We try to limit our interventions to broad segments or classes of intermediaries, we choose them based on judgments that improve functioning, will reduce systemic instability, have a material effect on credit flows in the economy, and that our actions have high odds of yielding improvements. Are we taking credit risks that will end up being paid for by the taxpayer? For the credit facilities that we've made available to multiple firms, we are not taking significant credit risk that might end up being absorbed by the taxpayer. There's a footnote in here saying, I recognize that for some of the other credit facilities to individual firms, we are taking probably a little more credit risk, but even there we've moved quite substantially to protect ourselves. For almost all the loans made, to the, late, made by the Federal Reserve, we look first to sound borrowers for repayment, then to underlying collateral. Moreover, we lend less than the value of the collateral with the size of the haircuts depending on the riskiness of the collateral and on the availability of market prices for the collateral. Some of our lending does involve non-recourse loans that look primarily to the collateral rather than the borrower for repayment in the event the value of the collateral falls below the amount loaned. In these circumstances, we insist on taking only the very highest collateral, lend less than the face amount of the collateral, and typically have other resources to absorb losses that might nonetheless occur, for example, Treasury capital for our lending against securitized loans. We have increased the amount of information that we publish about the collateral and other steps we take to protect against credit losses. But understandably, given the sharp increase in loans to new institutions and markets, the public is naturally interested in our lending practices, and we will be releasing even more information about what stands behind our loans in coming weeks. How will we gauge how much to do? 
This is a difficult question without a ready answer, even under more normal circumstances when we're focused on the federal funds rate. And it is even harder judgment when, as now, the federal funds rate's near zero and we're in intervening in other ways to affect financial conditions. We have some, albeit limited, ability to gauge the effects of large-scale asset purchases on interest rates, the effects of liquidity facilities like the TALF and other programs are even more difficult to assess and predict. And with markets disrupted and confidence depressed, the relationship between a particular constellation of interest rates and asset prices and future spending and inflation is even more uncertain than usual. We will continue to analyze these relationships in light of our experience, just our forecast of the evolution of the economy under various alternatives, but we certainly need to recognize that those forecasts could change appreciably and be ready to adapt policy flexibly. That flexibility could entail doing more to ease credit if the economy proves resilient to monitoring fiscal stimulus now on train or could involve doing less, reversing actions, to forestall potential inflationary effects of past actions, and I'll come back to that subject in a second. Engaging the effects of market interventions in the current crisis, one approach is to look to the size of increases in the quantity of reserves and money to judge whether sufficient liquidity is being provided to forestall deflation and support a turnaround in growth this approach is commonly known as quantitative easing. The linkages between reserves and money and between either reserves and money and, nom and nominal, either reserves or money and nominal spending are highly variable and not especially reliable under normal circumstances. You can remember all those money supply adjustments we were making there in 1981 and 1982. And the relationships among these variables become even more tenuous when so many short-term interest rates are pinned at zero and monetary and some non-monetary assets become near-perfect substitutes. In our approach to policy, the amount of reserves has been a result of our market interventions rather than a goal in and of itself. And depending on the circumstances, declines in reserves may indicate that markets are improving not that policy is effectively tightening or failing to lean against weaker demand. Still, we on the Open Market Committee recognize that high levels of Federal Reserve assets and resulting reserves are likely to be essential to fostering recovery. We have discussed whether some explicit objectives for growth in the size of our balance sheet or quantity of money base or reserves would provide some assurance that policy is pointed in the right direction. But we're not there yet, but we're still discussing. Will these policies lead to future surge in inflation? No, but the key to preventing inflation will be reversing the programs, reducing reserves, raising interest rates in a timely fashion. Our balance sheet has grown rapidly. The amount of reserves has skyrocketed. Announced plans imply further huge increases in Federal Reserve assets and bank reserves. Nonetheless, the size of our balance sheet will not preclude our raising interest rates when that becomes appropriate for macroeconomic stability. Many of the liquidity programs are authorized only while circumstances in the economy and financial markets are unusual and exigent. And such programs will be terminated when conditions are no longer so severe. Those programs and others have been designed to be unattractive in normal conditions. They will naturally wind down as markets improve. However, our newly purchased Treasury securities and MBS will not mature or be repaid for many years. The loans we are making to back securitization markets are for three years. Their non-recourse feature could leave us with assets after that. But we do have a number of tools we can use to absorb the resulting reserves and raise interest rates when the time comes. We can sell the Treasury and agency debt either on an outright basis or temporarily through reverse repurchase agreements, and we are developing the capability to do the same thing with MBS. We are paying interest on excess reserves, which we can use to help provide a floor for the federal funds rate as it does for other central banks 
even if declines in lending and open market operations are not sufficient to bring reserves down to the desired level. And finally, we are working with the Treasury to promote legislation that would further enhance our toolkit for absorbing reserves. Our work on the framework for exiting these programs is one indication that we are focused on maintaining price stability over time, even as we concentrate for now on promoting economic recovery. Another such indication is our increased emphasis on defining price stability goal more, di more directly. Already, the FOMC has extended its forecast horizon to indicate where the governors and Reserve Bank presidents would like to see inflation coming to rest over time. And we are continuing to discuss within the committee whether an explicit numerical objective for inflation would be beneficial. Under current circumstances, those benefits would include underscoring our understanding that our legislative mandate for promoting price stability encompasses both preventing inflation from falling too low in the near term and from rising too far as the economy recovers. And finally, have we compromised our independence? No, I don't think we have. Central banks all over the world and legislatures that created them have recognized that considerable independence from short-run political influence is essential for the conduct of monetary policy that promotes economic growth and price stability. To be sure, in the process of combating financial instability, we have needed to cooperate in unprecedented ways with the Treasury Department. Our actions with the Treasury to support individually systemically important institutions have sparked intense public and legislative interest. As Chairman Bernanke has indicated, as uh, Chairman Volcker just said, the absence of a regime for resolving systemically important non-bank financial institutions has been a serious deficiency in the current crisis and one that Congress needs to remedy. Congress and the public quite appropriately want to know more about lending programs that have greatly increased the scope and size of the Federal Reserve's interventions in financial markets, and we will give them that information. In addition, our country, like others, is undertaking a broad examination of what changes are needed in our financial regulatory system. This examination will consider the role of the Federal Reserve in supervision regulation, the advantages and disadvantages of establishing a systemic risk authority. It is natural and appropriate for our unusual actions in combating financial instability and recession to come under intense scrutiny. However, increased attention to and even the occasional criticism of our actions and our activities should not lead to a fundamental change in our place within our democracy. And I believe it will not. The essential role for an independent monetary policy authority pursuing economic growth and price stability remains widely appreciated, and the Federal Reserve has played that role well over the years. The recent joint statement of the Treasury and the Federal Reserve included an agreement to pursue further tools to control our balance sheet, indicating the administration's recognition of the importance of our ability to independently pursue our macroeconomic objectives. The Federal Reserve's actions over the past 20 months have been consistent with the principles of central banking that have been developed over the course of centuries. But the greatly increased complexity of our financial institutions and markets, as well as the virulence of the financial crisis and choking off the flow of credit through a broad range of channels, has meant that in applying these principles, the Federal Reserve and other central banks have had to extend their reach and adopt new measures to preserve financial stability and counter the effects of financial turmoil on the economy. In my view, these actions have been necessary, safe, and effective, will not lead to adverse after effects. But they've raised a number of questions that I tried to address today. I expect to be back here in 10 years to celebrate Dewey's 10th, 100th birthday. <laughs> at which time you can hold me accountable for my answers. Thank you.
I think, uh, of course, there are many, many dimensions to that. I think one of the interesting dimensions, uh, thinking about the monetary policy, the theme of my talk today, has been actually the similarity of the responses. There are differences, to be sure, and important differences, but many central banks have done approximately the same thing. They have broadened the collateral they've taken. They've, they've increased the maturity of the loans they're making. They've gone to new kinds of auction facilities to, uh, to get credit to banks. A lot, most most uh, other central banks, uh, at least in the industrial world, operate in uh, situations in which there wasn't – we never had Glass-Steagall, so they didn't have the sharp division between investment banks and commercial banks. And they were able to sort of do what we did with our investment bank uh, facilities was naturally came to them by just lending to commercial banks. Um, but we um, – I'm part of a, an international committee in the, in the BIS, the Global Financial System, Committee on Global Financial System. And over this period, we've sat there every couple months and talked about what we were doing and published some papers on it. And it's remarkable how uh, almost every central bank saw this um, shortage of liquidity uh, affecting banking systems beginning in August affecting the banking system through that, the rest of the economy, and acted in very similar ways to extend, to extend, their, extend their credit facilities. I just think that's one aspect. Another aspect, of course, has been a very, on the regulatory side, has been a very intense international effort to identify the weaknesses in the system and make changes across international systems. Uh, the Financial Stability Forum has been the center of activity here. And uh, it's been, a, a, I think, quite a good process, actually, having an international group sit down, figure out what went wrong in the securitization, and many of the things Paul and Steve talked about, securitization markets and other, other places, uh, bank capital, weaknesses in bank capital, that sort of thing, bank liquidity, and uh, drive a process of addressing those internationally uh, in international committee and the accounting uh, people, the IFRS, uh, I, I, the accounting board, international accounting boards on that group, and drive it in a much quicker, more coordinated way across, uh, across markets and across uh, na nations than uh, I would have thought uh, possible. So there are a lot, of, a lot of similar things going on in a lot of different countries. Total synchronization of the European downturn with the U.S. downturn was obvious. Looking at industrial production as early as early 2007, two years ago, but there was an awful lot of wishful thinking and saying that there had been a total decoupling and the U.S. would have a recession and they wouldn't. And so that the interest rate and other responses it seemed to be were six to nine months late over there. And now you hear about we're just going to let our automatic pilots, our safety nets, do the take the place of explicit exogenous fiscal stimulus. So you know, it worries me that we'll get into a situation which, as Paul said, where the U.S. actually recovers sooner, and then there'll be people pointing fingers saying, look at your deficits getting big again. Um, and uh, so I, I worry that, you know, uh, policy making by multinational committees is, is lagging behind ours and is going to create some strange growth. I think this is a point the administration has tried to make and others in the U.S. in the G20 and other international fora, that this is a global recession and it's going to require a global response. And uh, certainly the days of counting on the U.S. consumer to drive global expansion are over. And uh, that was never a sustainable situation anyhow. Uh, you think about the mid-90s to the mid-2000s to just a few years ago, it took huge increases first in investment in the United States and then in consumption and housing with the finance by drawing in savings from abroad. 
And that was one of the major drivers, that and Chinese growth were one of the major drivers of the global economy, and we, that's not going to work anymore. I think U.S. consumers are pulling back, obviously, and they're going to be amassing savings much more by not spending than by counting on the value of their houses uh, going up to finance their retirements. Um, so we'll, we will, we are moving to a place of better balance, I think, in the U.S., a more sustainable international balance. It's hard to see in the middle of the crisis, but I think they're just inevitably that's going to happen. And it's going to be up to the rest of the world, I think, to see, to replace the demand that used to come from U.S. consumers. I think people generally understand this. Um, and uh, certainly a, a point, been a point of discussion uh, in, in a lot of international fora. Yes? Uh, the jumbo mortgage market, uh, there is an increased default pressure on the jumbo market, and the jumbo lending activity has been essentially shut down. And, and the jumbo rates are currently 6.5%, historically very favorable rates. Uh, I'm coming from the Realtor Association, so uh, mm -hmm. talk to our members. And our members are saying that the primary reason why people are just walking away from the jumbo rates is not the low rates, but the sense of fairness, saying everyone else is getting 4.8%, why should I pay 65 As a result, there's a lot of hesitancy in the jumbo market. And naturally, as people fall, that means there's no activity on the high end, which pressures prices to fall and raises the default pressures. Right. Is there any possibility of including jumbo into the top program. We're looking at that. Uh, so I'm not sure that's the reason that market isn't working. People are angry that they're not getting the other guys low rates. I think that probably the rates are high. There isn't securitization. Their banks are making jumbo loans, but only what they can keep on their books. So I think helping to restart the liquidity in the housing market will depend on restarting the liquid, at least the upper end of the housing market will restarting this, and we are taking a very careful look at non-conforming RMBS uh, as a potential next uh, step in TALF. CMBS is, I think, the next one, but let's be honest. So, the, yes, we're looking at that. Yes, Scott. Uh, when I started the Fed, we, were, we had uh, Charlie Gomes, the Yankee swapper, and he was very proud of the $30 billion swap arrangement together. Uh, in the recent months and all of this, you have put together two sets of arrangements, one of which dollars were provided to other central banks, and more recently foreign currencies to, to the Fed. Can you explain these, how these are, are, are different and how they are being used? They're different from the earlier swap arrangements, how they are being used. So they're different from the earlier swap arrangements uh, because, I don't know, Bill, are you going to talk about this this afternoon? Or? Okay. We could wait. <laughs> Can't duck that one that way. Huh? I think they're they're very they're very very. The earlier swap arrangements were about financing intervention. These swap arrangements are about supplying, for the most part, dollar liquidity to foreign to foreign banks. They're about liquefying the dollar market, not about making. Um, intervening in dollar euro, for example, and they're not being used that way. They're being used to make loans to foreign banks through their own central banks, but in dollars. So it's a very, very different thing. Our, our uh, observation very early on, I think as early as August 07, was that uh, because the dollar swap market, the private dollar swap market, was uh, Im impaired the way many other interbank funding markets were impaired, uh, foreign commercial banks were bidding very, very heavily in the federal funds market here in the U.S. and driving those rates very high, especially early in the day before Europe shut down. So their dollar needs were putting pressure on our interest rates, upward pressure on our interest rates. That was part of the tightening of financial conditions. So we thought a better way of together, working together with the other central banks, a better way of approaching this instead of having them wait until early morning U.S. time to fill all their dollar needs and have to do it in a very short period of time would it be to make those dollars available for their liquidity uh, globally and keep the pressure out of the U.S. and keep uh, dollar interest rates on a more even keel. And I think they've been quite successful 
in that regard. The, um, the, what we call the mirror facilities we just put in with uh, a couple of the other central banks are for the, against the contingency of something like that happening to U.S. banks. U.S. banks need yen, euro, sterling, liquidity. They have trouble getting it. This is a way of them getting it without disrupting those markets. So but it's not, not needed right now, not necessary right now. It's a backup facility, sort of a just-in-case. I don't, I don't expect it to be used, but I think what, one thing we've learned over the last 20 months is having backup facilities in place is not a bad idea. So I think the stress test results are being kind of compiled as we speak, actually, uh, and uh, discussions are ongoing about the implications of what they would be. The idea, however, uh, is to build confidence in the system, to say the, the, have the supervisors do a stress scenario, a common stress scenario across uh, the most important commercial banks in the system, and then to make sure that they have the capital and the strength to survive that stress scenario in good condition so that they are well capitalized when they come out of that stress scenario. And I think and they can get the money themselves. If they can't get the money themselves, the U.S. Treasury will make it available through TARP. Uh, so I think I... I, I I'm sure that the, or I, I hope that the way this is read is as a confidence-inducing exercise. There are some, some commercial banks who already understand that because of the effects of the uh, crisis on their balance sheets and their conditions, they need to make changes in how they do business. They need to raise capital. They need to... Uh, build stronger business franchises, and uh, uh, I think that that push to strengthening the banks will continue with and without the TARP capital. Paul. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> Talk about your dedication to stability, price stability. And then some other words slip in here. We're trying to decide what amount of inflation is conducive to economic expansion. I said, what are they talking about? <laughs> I thought they were talking about stability, but now we're talking about inflation being conducive to economic expansion. I saw it. I don't ordinarily look at the reports of the committee meetings, but somehow I told you to look at the last one. There was a sentence there, they're actually considering to quantify how much inflation we want in the interest of economic expansion. Next sentence said we're in favor of price stability. I don't get it. <laughs> I, I don't get it in part. I know all this business about worrying about deflation, which we haven't had for 50 years. But, you know, if 2% is great for expansion and the expansion lags a little bit, isn't the implication 3% even a little better? No. Why not? Yeah. So I think <laughs> I, I, I take your point. Why not zero? Or effectively zero plus whatever the measurement error. If we have a 1% measurement error, why aren't we aiming at one? And I think the, the, the reason is uh, you can see in the where we are right now. So if we were aiming at one and had been at one, interest rates would have started from a lower level when the shock hit, and we would have gotten down to zero faster. So I think by aiming at two, say, you have a little more room in nominal interest rates, 
a little more room to react to, uh, to uh, an adverse shock to the economy, more better odds on stabilizing the economy. And I don't think, I don't think that two, I mean, the, the risk is, if you could, I think you would agree that if you were at two and could stick with two forever, the difference between that and one isn't a big deal. But your problem is two becomes three becomes four. I think if we can uh, look at the experience of other countries who have, where that hasn't happened, they're all aiming around two. Uh, and, and, and I also think we need, we, need, we need to be clear about why we're choosing the number we're choosing, why higher rates, inflation tends, the higher you get, the more variable inflation gets. It's very hard to stabilize. You have distortions in the tax system and other things that make higher inflation uh, adverse. So I, I, I guess I, I think the costs and benefits of doing two rather than one, two measured rather than one measure. It wouldn't be that precise about it. Sometimes inflation goes up a little. Sometimes it goes down a little. Right. But telling people that in a generation they're going to lose half their purchasing power, when do we begin taking zeros off the dollar? I think they can if they, if they in 35 years would lose half their purchasing power. I think the nominal interest rates will reflect that. They'll get er rates of return that protect their purchasing power. So what good does it do you? Because it gives us this cushion on nominal interest rates on the way down against adverse shocks. We've been twice in the last 10 years, we've been at interest at policy rates close to zero. Now we're at zero, policy rates close to zero. The Japanese were at zero for a long time and ended up in a recession and ended up in a recession that they couldn't really get out of for a while, may not be out of yet. And I think our uh, attempt not, is to protect against now, getting the those Japanese rates pinned. experience, they were in a recession when they had a little bit of inflation. When the consumer price index actually went down is when their recovery started. I don't think I'm going to persuade you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've stated my case and you've stated your case. I don't think I can persuade you either. That's what bothers you. <laughs> what, would, uh, what would you change in the implementation of this monetary policy? Do you, do you well, I, I don't, what you mean, it's true. They can't get nominal interest rates below zero. I understand that. But I, I suppose that you get this bad a situation, you go to zero. <laughs> That's no different than that. Respect. It's just a question of what you're aiming for in the future. So but you, I grew up, I mean, I, I am. I, I followed uh, Dewey's footsteps at the, at the Kennedy School, God knows how many years ago. And I remember the lecture I got. I remember the professor sitting in a room like this telling me what this country needs is 2 or 3% rate of inflation. It's a good thing. He didn't quite convince me. 50 years ago. <laughs> and I haven't convinced you today. You're not going to convince me now. <laughs> right. I think when you're, the, the, you and Alan both had the same definition of inflation, right? It was sort of where people don't have the power to raise interest well, rates. Raise prices. It, yeah. Right. And uh, I think our thinking is that we need to be, in the, particularly in the current circumstances, we need to be a little clearer than that because we face two risks. One is that inflation expectations start dropping and continue to drop, and that'll raise real interest rates at a time when the economy is weak and the federal funds rates are already pinned at zero. And we could get into, you said we hadn't seen deflation in 50 years. I don't think, I don't expect to see deflation in the next five years either, but I can't say the risk is zero, and it would be a very very bad thing at this point. We face the other risk, which is the one I tried to address in the talk. We've got all these assets on our balance sheet. Surely that will result in inflation down the road. It always has in the past. It always will in the future. And I think, once again, by being clearer about our objective about what we consider price stability, we will have armed ourselves to lean against tendencies for inflation to rise well, that by giving be, people a good warning at a time asking. and hopefully anchor those expectations. I understand. We'll see whether that's true or not when you get there. Yeah, we will find out. What do we? We went too far, too fast towards transparency. And that's probably not a view anybody else would accept. Uh, agree with.
Okay. Why don't we make that the last statement? <laughs>